That's better. Hey, uh, Connor, can you do me a favor? Can we go back to the worship song, Another in the Fire? And if you could put uh, a lyric up there. Can you go to that? Uh, just go, go to the middle. Go to the middle uh, where it talks about bowing down. Okay, ready? I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. Keep going. I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between us, between where's thin. Next one. I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in, and nothing stands between us. Talk to me. Uh, what, uh, what does this song do in your heart? Hope and comfort, and what else? Uh, say again. Stand strong, courage, yes. What else? Joy. What was that? He is powerful. Fearlessness, knowing he's with you. Say? Safety. Woo. I, I don't know about you, but I felt like worship and song this morning was something that was building up in heaven. And the, the crescendo was this. And I was thinking... Man, Lord, uh, give me more strength. Give me more faith. All the things that were just shared just now from that song. And so we're just going to continue to ask Holy Spirit to work in our hearts, change our minds, and change our hearts, and ask for more. Amen? Amen. Acts chapter 25 today. You can go ahead and begin turning there if you have not already. Acts chapter 25 as we continue our series, The Great Adventure, A Journey Through the Book of Acts. Before we dive in, I want to just kind of speak to a potential temptation that may arise this morning as we begin. And that is, when we read scripture, and whether that's in the secret place, you and Jesus, or we do it in this context, or you're doing it in a small group, or just one-on-one -on -one with someone, uh, what often happens is, is, is we miss the opportunity to press in in the moment. Because oftentimes we already know how the story goes. You know what I'm saying? And oftentimes we miss, I think, what Holy Spirit wants to do more, especially those of us who just have been hearing the stories time and time again. But we already know how the story ends. I'm going to ask that we not give in to the temptation to already get past what Acts 25 is saying, okay? Can we do that together? Awesome. So we need the Holy Spirit to help us in that in Jesus' name. Last week, we talked about finding courage in the fire, not out of it. And you know as well as I do that uh, we don't like the fire. We, we, wanna, we want God to move in our hearts and change us like if he can do it like when we don't have to go through it. But that's the way of Christ and God. He wants to take you through it oftentimes. And so God's design, his design, because he loves you, his design and best work in our lives takes place mostly in and through the fire, which often then causes us to ask a real key important question. And that question is, why? Why? It's like that was usually the first word that you learned when you began to speak. Why? 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 And as you're an adult, especially pressing in and wanting more of Christ in and through you, we, it's like we relive that, right? We, 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 we say that word oftentimes. Why? Why? Well, we're going to continue to look at this morning Paul's unfair trial. It is an unfair trial. We're going to also look at Paul's stand for the truth against all the lies and accusations. And also we're going to look at God's continued promise of providing courage. But first, but first, a fresh reminder. Throughout the pages of Scripture, we see this regular occurrence. And it is a conflict between God and and government. A conflict between God and government. A war 
of who is in full and complete control and authority versus who is not. God versus Satan. This war began in heaven when Satan and a third of the angels united against God, thinking that they could be greater than Yahweh, the first sin, by the way, called the Great Rebellion. The Great Rebellion. This war between Satan and a third of the angels versus Michael the archangel and all of the rest was a victorious war Won by who? God. This is in Revelation chapter 12. You can read that later today. Satan and the dark angels were then kicked out of heaven and cast onto the earth. And since then, the kingdom of this world has been in diabolical opposition to the kingdom of God. It was the kingdom of darkness that tempted and deceived Humanity, Adam and Eve, you and I, causing them to sin and rebel against God. The world, mankind, has been in this war ever since. Now today, the kingdom of darkness continues to do everything within its power to destroy that which God loves the most, his creation. That is you and me. It is as if Lucifer declared to God when he was cast to the earth, you can have heaven, I will have the world, and do everything to destroy humanity. Humanity, you and I, we sit smack dab right in the middle of this war. The kingdom of darkness versus the kingdom of God. And it was God himself through the person of Jesus Christ that came and rescued you and me from sin and death, eternal separation from God, damnation. This is the greatest display of love to ever be demonstrated. An operation called the greatest rescue. The greatest rescue. And in the meantime, the kingdom of sa Satan seeks to steal, kill, and destroy in that order. Steal, kill, and destroy. And I don't know about you, but this makes me angry. This makes me rage inside against the enemy of darkness that seeks to deceive and accuse and lie to mankind. And so what is our position today as a follower of Jesus and as a united front, as a faith community that we call ourselves Living Water Church? And to all who step in, other faith communities as well, local and abroad, who say this is in fact the fight that we are in. And so today, I'm praying and hoping that you will be willing to step in yet again. We are willing to even be called names and hated for the sake of the gospel kingdom mission of love and giving the people, giving people, our friends and family, all who God puts in front of us. We are willing and able in Jesus' name to give Jesus who is our great rescuer. Amen? Amen. And so this war between God and Satan has been going on before and since the likes of King Kemet ne ah, let me see if I can say that. King Nebuchadnezzar's government, for example, and this is found in Daniel chapter 3. It'll be on the screen behind me. Verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, "Is it true that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up, I will give you one more chance. This is King Nebuchadnezzar. I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue that I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace, into the fire. 
And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power. By the way, that is what's called mockery. Verse, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied. Now listen to this. O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he does not, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. Gold statue. Just like this. In other words, the Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, say essentially this. Do what you think is necessary, O king, but we will not bow down to you. We will serve only our king, the most high God. And the Hebrew boys were cast into the furnace as a way to show that government is in charge and God is not. And so let's see how that works out. Verse 24. But suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors as he's looking into the furnace, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted. Uh, here now he's being an evangelist. Kind of interesting, huh? Look, look, I see four men unbound walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. This was Jesus. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, officials, and governors, and advisors, the rest of the government, crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed, and the clothing was not scorched. Listen, they did not even smell of smoke. Not only has this war between God and government been going on since the days of ne King Nebuchadnezzar versus the Hebrew boys, you can include the likes of Moses, Elijah, John the Baptist, just to name a few, and of course, King Jesus who were all told, who were all told, stop sharing and spreading the gospel or you'll die. And who else? Paul versus the Roman government. And that's what we've been looking at. This build-up story, especially the last couple of weeks as we wind down the incredible book of Acts. And since Paul's supernatural born-again salvation experience, which is recorded in Acts chapter 9, his assignment, Paul's purpose of bringing the gospel to the Jews and then to the Gentiles, eventually to the ends of the earth. What's the ends of the earth here in Paul's mission and assignment? It is to the central location of the world at the time, Rome. And what we've seen is this buildup, especially in the last few chapters of Acts, a growing conflict between God and the government, specifically the Roman government. And how is Paul able to experience such courage standing against the Roman government who, who really postured themselves and shout, showed their power against the gospel and the kingdom of God? You see, Paul's courage came from a confidence that God is in complete control. And whatever it looked Whatever it took to see Paul through God's purpose and will, he was unafraid to live and die for Jesus Christ. And that is the title of this message this morning called Living and Dying for Christ. Let's pray. Now, Father, we need you. I pray that you would increase in each person sitting here physically and even those who are tuned in online. And Father, through your supernatural power that comes straight from you and from heaven, give us more courage today. Encourage us, Father. 
possess us with Holy Spirit for more courage and more confidence and boldness and peace. Help us as we open your word today and look at an amazing brother that you used named Paul. I pray that you would get me out of the way today and may your spirit move and change us from the inside out. What no human can ever do, only you. We give you permission to do that in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. I want you to consider this question this morning. That just simply means you don't have to blurt out an answer. You can just consider this. This is a rhetorical question to consider. Who is in full, complete control of your life right now as we sit here? Who is in full and complete control of your life? There's only two options. I have to tell you the truth today. The two options that are laid before you and I is either Jesus or the evil one. And so who is in full, complete control of your life? You may be here today and you say, well, I am. I'm in complete control of my life. I dictate where I go and what I do and who I talk to and who am I f- who's a friend of mine and who's an enemy, and I dictate my life. No one else. Uh, I, I love you, which means I have to tell the truth. You are deceived by the enemy by thinking that you can dictate your own life. It is either Jesus or the evil one. Who is in complete, full control of your life? At this point in the Acts story, Paul has been in prison for two years. A lot of waiting, a lot of thinking. We looked at that last week. And we see in the first five verses of Acts chapter 25, the Jews do some politicking to try and trick Governor Festus in hopes to kill Paul on the way. Seems that politics has really not changed over time. Uh, But God supernaturally uses Festus. He supernaturally uses the government and Festus to protect Paul by telling the mob that Paul's going to remain in Caesarea. He'll be over there. And that they would have to travel there in order to make an accusation against him. All the while, he'd be protecting him. And so the court proceedings continue in verse 6 of Acts 25. Go there. Here we go. About eight and t- or ten days later, Festus returned to Caesarea, and on the following day, he took his seat in court and ordered that Paul be brought in. Now, we're all in the court today. We're all in, in the courtroom, okay? Get in the story, right? We're all here. Uh, verse 7, when Paul arrived, the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem gathered around and made many serious accusations they could not prove. Hmm. Paul denied the charges. I am not guilty of any crime against the Jewish laws or the temple or the Roman government, he said. Then Festus, waiting to plead, uh, wanting to please the Jews, asked him, are you willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there? But Paul replied, no. This is the official Roman court, so I ought to be tried right here. You know very well I am not guilty of harming the Jews. Despite what you all say and all the accusations and all the gaslighting, you must know that I'm not guilty of harming any of the Jews. If I have done something worthy of death, I don't refuse to die. But if I'm innocent, no one has a right to turn me over to these men to kill me. I appeal to Caesar. Festus conferred with his advisors and then replied, very well, you have appealed to Caesar. And to Caesar, you will go. If that's what you want, that's what you'll get. You see, God's plan and purpose has many ups and downs, doesn't it? Has many twists and turns, highs and lows, valleys and mountaintops. How else are we going to stay determined and focused on the straight and narrow, trusting our ultimate guide, who is Jesus? Question. And you can talk to me here because we're an interactive bunch. So, where, where is supernatural courage found? Jesus? Yeah? Are we in agreement? This is where supernatural courage is found. 
Okay, so how then is supernatural courage found? How? Prayer. Holy Spirit. Grace. Praise. Yeah, praise. What else? Say again. I'm sorry. Belief. Anything else? Worship. Supernatural courage is found in and through the fire. And we are safe. Church, you're safe in the hands of the living God. Protected. Covered. And so the question today is, how are we going to live and die for Christ? Like that's, that's like two major contrasts. How are we going to live and die for Christ? Well, I want to leave with you three truth statements. These are truth statements and not just to get you motivated and on the track to positivity because we kick negativity out. It's more than that. We're talking about truth statements, statements that we believe according to God's word and the power of his spirit that lives in us, which is the same power that raised Jesus from the, amen? Do you believe that? Okay. So these are truth statements. Telling the truth. And here's the first one. Opposition is opportunity. I think you've heard that before from up here. Opposition is opportunity. Do you believe that? Opposition is opportunity. As Paul continued to be pushed higher and higher up the uh, food chain of the Ro Roman government, like passed off, passed off to the next higher official. You see what hap what's happening here? Like, I can't deal with them. I, I don't kind of see what's wrong, but I don't. Uh, but I, uh, the people hate Paul, so I got to do what the people want, government. And so I got I to gotta see what's the majority. So, uh, But at the same time, okay, Paul, I'm going to pass you on to somebody higher uh, than me up the food chain. This is what's happening. And what's happening at the very same time, because opposition is always opportunity in Jesus' name. Here you see Paul being put literally in front of seemingly very powerful people. The government, at the same time, put more pressure on him so that why? He would concede and that he would recant and that he would do that publicly. That was the goal. Because the example to be used by somebody as influ influential for the sake of the gospel as Paul, and in order to stop that and shut it down and demonstrate and posture up in pride and say, God is not in charge, we are. We are. We carry the power. We carry the authority. We are in complete control. Um, the reality is that never turns out well. But God continues to give Paul more courage in the midst of this. Because why? Opposition is always opportunity. Um, he t continues to give Paul more courage, greater influence, and, in fact, more opportunity to share the gospel of Christ to many, many more, to more people, and to more professional influencers and kings. But the path there, though, let's, looks much like this. I was going to show this last week, but... I felt it would be better to show it today. This is the path more in what it looks like. And I've showed th shared this before. I, I think this is something to really kind of lean into. God, I want to be used by you because I love you. I want to be on the straight and narrow of the gospel, love, and mission that you've called. And so, God, my plan is can you just get me to the finish line already? When's Jesus going to come back? Because this world's like burning and burning. So can we just get on with the, like the like to the end when in reality God's plan is the bottom one. I need to tell you the truth today that opposition is always opportunity, church. And the road there looks much like this, which is his plan to strengthen us, not in our own power, but in whose power? In whose power? In whose power? Yes. Next slide. We'll kind of bring it home, I think. God, I have a plan for your life, 
and this is really what it feels like. I'm sure Paul could really relate to this. I'm sure many of you can. The Holy Spirit's like, let's go then. Let's go. And then we're like, ah, get me out of here. <laughs> no. I'm feeling kind of queasy. Opposition is always opportunity. You know, in, in uh, college, I was, uh, my freshman year, I, I played basketball. And it was the championship game. And um, I was playing defense. And the guy in front of me was dribbling. <laughs> and um, I used to be a lot more flexible, by the way, back in the day. All right. And so he got past me, and I kind of, like, came behind him, and I poked the ball. And now my teammate has got the ball, and it's, like, 10 seconds left. I'm not even embellishing this. Like, this is the real thing. I'm not, I'm not trying to make me hear the story. At the same time, so I, I, I call out for the ball, and I say, Mark. And so he throws it, and now I'm, like, wide open. I can win this game. I can win it. And, uh, and so I got the ball, had brand-new shoes on, and I went up. I didn't dunk it, um, tried, but I, but I could never really dunk consistently. But I did go up and do a layup and won the game. Won the game. That was amazing. Uh, but what happened was I got undercutted and somehow did some three, 360 in the air and landed on my left leg. And my left leg broke in two places. I apologize. Uh, this is my story. And in the course of that time, uh, through a series of uh, difficulties in my healing, having a full leg cast um, in the college uh, health, health um, room, uh, asking a lot of questions. And my question, like, increased. It got louder and louder. And my question sounded like this. Why? 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 What I do? Why'd you do this? Because I, I want to, I, I, I'm, your, I'm your warrior. Here I am in Bible school. I'm getting prepared for the ministry. Why? Why this? Why now? Why to me? And it seemed that nobody could answer that question for me. That was frustrating. Because I wanted, I was looking to man. I'm like, why did this happen to me? In fact, my dad came 2,000 miles away and came into my room in the hospital at this point and uh, didn't even say a word. And I, the minute he got past that door, I said, Dad, why did God do this to me? And uh, he said, I don't know, son. I don't know. So nobody could answer that question for me. I was frustrated. Can you relate to me? Well, uh, so alone, seems that there's a theme in my life, alone in a hospital room. Yet again, asking the question, why? The Holy Spirit, like, said, son, I want to heal you. I can literally remove that cast, mend your bone, and I can have you walk out of here in a second. But I need to heal something deeper in you. You with me? I need to heal something deeper in you. I can, I can give you physical health. That's what God's done. We've seen people in this room. Like that, in Jesus' name, be healed. And we've also seen frustration. Why? Why isn't it happening now? Why isn't it happening to me? All these things. And the Holy Spirit convicted me because that's what he does, because he loves us. And said, son, I need to tell you something. There's a, there's a question that you're asking is so wrong. You just need to change it up a little bit. Just drop the Y and add AT and ask what? What are you trying to do in my life? What are you trying to show me so that I may follow and trust you more in the fire? Instead of why, ask what. And I can tell you that the minute that clicked for me, my rehab and even to get back on the basketball court took two years after that. Um, I was in a wheelchair because I had to have major surgery. Doctor said, you know what, there's a problem in your healing. It's not healing right. If you ever want to walk again, you're going to have to have surgery. You're going to have to have a rod put in your, 
in your leg, and that's what still sits here today. It is robo leg. <laughs> Instead of asking the question why, ask what? Opposition is? Opposition is? In Jesus' name. The second truth statement I want to leave with you today when we're talking about living and dying for Christ. Both in one. Live protected, die covered. Live protected, die covered. Living and dying is a win-win. Did you know that? As followers of Jesus, living and dying is a win-win. And Paul shares it here in Philippians chapter 2, 22-23. Let the words of Christ wash over you. For I fully expect and hope, Paul says, that I will never be ashamed, but that w- that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more faithful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I don't know what's better. I'm torn between the two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far, far better for me. Do you relate to Paul? Living and dying for Christ. Uh, Talk to me. We're going to do just a kind of a countdown really quick, okay? You guys with me? You guys all right? Okay, cool. All right, so this is the interaction part, part two. We're going to look at the two top fears that people have, okay? Just generally speaking, the Two, the top four fears that people have, okay? So talk to me. What do you think would be number four? <laughs> think like ladders and heights. That's number four. Number three? Spiders. Spiders. Number two? Dying. Dying. And number one? Public speaking. Public speaking. Heights, spiders, death, public speaking. Now, the great Jerry Seinfeld uh, will explain it here in the video. I saw a thing, actually, a study that said speaking in front of a crowd is considered the number one fear of the average person. I found that amazing. Number two was death. (laughs) Death is number two? This means to the average person, if you have to be at a funeral, you would rather be in the casket than doing the eulogy. Isn't there a lot of truth there? Rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. You see, Paul had the two top fears, death and public speaking. He had that covered in Jesus' name by the Spirit of God, in supernatural courage, which is available to you and to me today. Death is difficult. Why? Because death was never God's original design. That's why it's hard to deal with. We struggle. When we see those who are closest to us gone, it's hard. There's even grief that sits here today when those closest to you have been taken. And that is also the story about my mother. You know, my job as a uh, pastor, as a reverend, qualifies me in the state of California to officially marry and bury, to do weddings and funerals. And uh, I, I do that quite often. And previous to my mother's passing, knowing that being a pastor, uh, a reverend, a professional pastor in, the, in, the, um, in, in public. I have people who, who find out about me or know me because this is our congregation, for example, and they ask me, you know, Rob, I, I want you to do a funeral service or a graveside or a celebration of life or a memorial. And uh, previous to my mom's passing, uh, knowing that that is always usually a yes, that I'll be more than happy to do that when asked and invited to and to honor loved ones. Um, After my mom's passing, you know, it kind of, uh, it's changed for me. Um, I'll still pray and consider the yes. 
But doing funerals and celebration of life, uh, ceremonies and memorials, etc., since my mom passed, uh, is a little bit close to home. And, you know, because I'm human, there's days I'll, I'll, be, I'll be doing what I need to do, like in my office called Pete's Coffee, or in my vehicle driving, or walking, or wha- and, and all of a sudden, like, I want to talk to mom. And then realize, not now, but someday. Live protected. Die covered. Death was never in the plans. But as we talked about on the friend end of this message, the kingdom of darkness continues to deceive and continue to lie about what is life and what is not. I want to give a shout out to my dad who's tuning in. Love you, Father. And this message is a tribute to mom. My last truth statement is this. The wicked will fall. Say will fall. The wicked will fall. The righteous will rise. I want to say that again. The wicked will fall. The righteous will will rise. Do you believe that? But you're not supposed to be judging. The wicked will fall. The righteous will rise. Back to the story. Festus grants Paul to stand before Caesar, and his case is then handed to King Agrippa, who says to Festus in Acts 25, verse 14. Here we go. We're going to run through this. During their stay of several days, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. There's a prisoner here, he told him, whose case was left for me by Felix. When I was in Jerusalem, the leading priests and Jewish elders pressed charges against him and asked me to condemn him. I pointed out to them that Roman law does not convict people without a trial. They must be given an opportunity, a fair trial, to confront their accusers and defend themselves. When his accusers came here for the trial, I didn't delay. I called the case the very next day and ordered Paul brought in. Verse 18, but the accusations made against him weren't any of the crimes I expected. Instead, it was something about their religion. Their religion. Like they just think they're holier than thou. And they talk about some dead man named Jesus who who Paul insists that, like, he's a lot. Come on. (laughs) What a joke. Verse 20, I was at a loss to know how to investigate these things because this is what the Holy Spirit does upon those who think that they're in charge and that God is not. And so I asked him whether he would be willing to stand trial on these charges in Jerusalem. But Paul appealed to have his case decided by the emperor. So I ordered that he be held in custody until I could arrange to send him to Caesar. And I'd like to hear the man myself, Agrippa said. And Festus replied, you will tomorrow. You will tomorrow. Paul's confidence and courage came from the truth that his faithful stand was a guaranteed win. Why? Why? Because he knew the victorious Jesus and that he was on his side. Do you believe today that Jesus is on your side? Do you believe that he is for you and not against you? Despite the world's message and despite the constant accusatory lies, especially if you're watching the the messaging from the news that's saying, God's not, no, don't, stop praying. Why are you praying? That does nothing. That's what the world's saying. You know, if we just, if we just kind of like all just believe the same thing, then that'll keep us all on the straight and narrow. All these lies and accusations, posturing, man posturing saying, I'm in charge and God's not. Is Jesus on your side? I'm here to declare that Jesus is on the side of this faith community in Jesus' name. Why? Because I speak louder and because I puff my chest up? No, because I know the one who died for me and who lives and who is on the throne today, living and using us, that he would call us for such a time as this. Do you believe that? That Jesus is on your side? And truth is, history shows that whenever 
any antichrist government regimes try and flex their power and control declaring and end control declaring themselves as God, listen, never turns out well. It never turns out well. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 and 29, why do I know this? Because the truth speaks despite the lies. This is from the message. Do you see what we've got? Do you see what we've got? An unshakable kingdom. And do you see how thankful we must be? Not only thankful, but brimming with worship, deeply reverent before our God. For God is not an indifferent bystander. Indifference means I don't care. He's not an I don't care kind of God. He's not just, I don't care about that. That's not God. He's actively cleaning house, torching all that needs to burn, and he will not quit until it's all cleansed. God himself is fire. God himself is fire. Now, I don't like to really do this often. I really don't. But I, I prayed about it this week. I really did. And I, I kind of toggled back and forth between Holy Spirit and it was like a table tennis, yes, no, yes, no, no, yes. And then finally, I really got the confidence and uh, Jesus gave me the permission to do this. This is my uh, uh, secret place devotional. This is my journal. And um, I, previous to the call of, of journaling, um, I could tell you and show you all of the uncompleted journals in my life. But for two years, my, my sweet time with, with the Lord has been uh, uh, reading and journaling and praying. And so today in asking uh, the Holy Spirit in preparation of this message, um, where I would normally like to keep my vers- personal devotion with Jesus private, um, sometimes that comes out of the secret place in through, in through devotion and journaling, and that here God has given me the permission to share it publicly. So the last couple weeks, uh, the, the Lord's got me camped, like, like camping, like, like I got s'mores, I am pl- uh, like I'm cooking s'mores by the campfire. Like this is where the Lord's got me the last couple weeks, like settled and enjoying relationship with him. And that's the picture I want to give you. And, um, and so the Lord like brought a verse to my attention a couple weeks ago, and I wrote it down. I, I declared it on paper. And it went something like this, uh, Psalm 37, 34. Put, you, put your hope in the Lord. Travel steadily along his path. He will honor you by giving you the land. You will see the wicked destroyed. Um, and, then, and then another one, uh, Psalm 1, 4. Uh, not the wicked, they are like worthless chaff scattered by the wind. And then another one, Isaiah 3, 10 through, through 11. Tell the godly that all will be well for them. Uh, they will enjoy the rich reward they have earned, but the wicked are doomed, for they will get exactly what they deserve. Uh, kind of like not pleasant verses that you'd probably put on a mug. You know what I'm saying? Um, like this, this real clear like line in the sand, like this contrast between what God will do to the wicked. Imminent judgment. They laugh now, but what's coming tomorrow is no longer a laughing matter. And at the same time, over here, the righteous will be lifted up. Where you have been in the fire, and people have been telling you, just curse God and die. In the fire, when, when people have said, uh, let me encourage you, um, the, the, the Bible thing that you try and, like, use as a guide to your life, like, try something different. Like, try this book. You know, all kinds of demonic philosophies and ideas. And the last couple weeks, I have to tell you from my journaling, has been this incredible, like, peace and hope and courage of knowing what God will do with the wicked and what God will do with the righteous. Um, It has been incredible strength, and I thank the Lord for it. I love those seasons when uh, he says, be still and know that I am God. Uh, In those seasons, even in this journal, um, I've come to give you life and life to the full. 
But in this season, the wicked will fall. The righteous will rise. I know this, that the Apostle Paul relied a lot on the book of Psalms. And uh, he, in fact, in his letters, would refer often to the book of Psalms. And so I would imagine that in a lot of that trial and that nonsense and false accusations and, and, and all the stuff, Paul was leaning on Psalm 37, 12 through 13, the wicked plot against the godly. They snarl at them in defiance. But the Lord just laughs, for he sees their day of judgment coming. Psalm 37, 32 through 33, the wicked wait in ambush for the godly, looking for an excuse to kill them. But the Lord will not let the wicked succeed or let the godly be condemned when they are put on trial. Romans 12, 19, dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back says the Lord. By the way, that's a reference to what Deuteronomy 32, 35 in the Old Testament refers to. God is a revenge God. The wicked will fall. The righteous will rise. In conclusion today, I want to ask you this question. Who occupies more of your thoughts and time? Is it God or the government? It doesn't mean that we hide our we, it doesn't mean we bury our heads in the sand and say, well, I just don't do the politic thing or the government thing. I just, I just, I just you know, I just, I want the happy life. Like, I'm here to tell you, like, look, like, it's okay to kind of know what's happening. And the fact of the matter is, if you do not know this already, this is breaking news. Say breaking news. The battle is God versus the government. Is it just our government? No. It's the world. This is, in fact, the fight, the war that we're in and that you're in. And will you fight with the weapons that have been provided for you as followers of Jesus for such a time as this, the weapons of justice and peace and courage and boldness, peacemaking, actual love, compassion in Jesus' name. I'm here to tell you, church, in closing, that that is what Living Water Church is about. We will fight in Jesus' name. And so you and I must answer and reconcile this question today, who's in control? Who is supremely reigning right now, God or Satan? Jesus or government? The kingdom of God or the kingdom of this world? You see, answering this question and walking in the light and truth of this reality today and beyond is going to provide you with supernatural courage. And then this question, who is on the throne of your heart today, ruling and reigning? Romans 8, 35 through 39 says, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing, say nothing, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed, nothing in all creation will ever, ever be able to separate us from the love of God. That is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's stand. Today there is a decision to be made. And resting in the conviction and in the peace and in the obedience or pushing us towards obedience through the Spirit of God, there is a response today necessary. Uh, Who do you serve? Who do you serve? 
who will you serve? And if you're here today and you do not know Christ as your personal Savior, why are you waiting? Today is the day of salvation. And the path of destruction can stop today in your life by giving your heart and your life to the king who gave his life for you. And you can begin living for real. That offer is for you today, not because it's some gimmicky offer. It's because of what the word of God in promise and in his word states and says and has demonstrated. God loves you. And so do we. If that's you and you need, you need to talk through that and, and process that, we, have, we have people that are willing and able to walk through that with you. Look, there's no shame in being in front of people and walking over here because you want prayer. And not, no one's going to be asking, oh, they must be really having a real hard time in their life. I wonder what it is. Maybe it's their faith. That's not what we do here. If you know that God is calling you to receive prayer, no shame no guilt, only life. Come and ask another brother or sister to walk with you right now. And then the rest of you, make the decision. Who will you serve? And who will remain at the throne of your heart? Father, we thank you for such a time as this. I am so grateful and encouraged today because of your word. Lord, the fact that you would use us for the sake of the gospel in the world that we're living now. Father, we thank you that there's no opposition that will tear us or break us or deter us because we know who our king is and the government that, that we follow, the kingdom of God. Help us today. We love you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said.